Hello, I'm Rachel Deere, host of today's program, COVID-19, Keeping Up with a Moving Target. Thank you for joining us. This activity is jointly provided by the Postgraduate Institute for Medicine, DKB Med, and the Institute for Johns Hopkins Nursing. Today's program is accredited for ANCC, AAPA, and AMA PRA Category 1 credit. Please visit our website for complete CE information. If you're tuning into our webcast, please click the Claim Credit button on the webinar console. Otherwise, please go to covid19.dkbmed.com, navigate to our multi-specialty episodes, and select this webinar to claim credit. Today's learning objective is to describe population immunity towards Omicron BA4 and BA5 subvariants. Today's learning objective is to describe implications of pre-existing immunity on rapid antigen testing. This activity is supported by an independent medical education grant from Gilead Sciences, as well as in-kind support from DKB Med. With us today, we have Dr. Paul Alwater, Clinical Director of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Joining him to discuss the Omicron variant and COVID-19 testing is Dr. Michael Mina, Chief Science Officer at EMED and an epidemiologist, immunologist, and physician. Doctors, thank you for your time today. Thanks so much. i delighted that uh, Dr. Michael Mina can join us. Um, uh, this is the uh, second uh, segment of uh, a two-part series on uh, current Omicron variants and impact on a variety of things that I think are important for clinicians. We're gonna focus a bit more on testing and maybe I'll start with a brief uh, anecdote. Um, I had not yet uh, gotten COVID. I've uh, had uh, two boosters up until the same day that Tony Fauci uh, developed COVID-19 and I did the same day. Um, I had gotten a second booster in, hmm, I guess it was, um, I'm going to say, our early May. Uh, and so I came down with this sometime in uh, 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 mid-June. So, you know, five, six weeks after a booster. I don't know which uh, Omicron uh, variant I, I had. Um, <clears throat> and as I went through this illness, um, I was sort of wondering and doing the antigen testing, I elected not to take an antiviral drug. I did not take Nermtrelivir or Ritonavir. Uh, but I had, and I've done a lot of point of care antigen testing, but my, uh, the, my band was blazingly purple, which was the uh, color choice first, very faint, and then boy, by two to three days into my symptoms, blazingly thick and bright. Um, I remained antigen positive through day 11, even though I just really had minimal symptoms, some fatigue and cough still at that point, but definitely resolving back to work and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, for people that are obsessive or scientifically curious or have a ton of kits at home, many of them are testing and uh, with the antigen kits uh, as they become infected for a variety of reasons. So Michael, uh, I wanted to uh, just focus first a bit on uh, something which may have always happened, to be honest. Uh, I don't think we know as much earlier in the pandemic with these antigen uh, kits. Uh, perhaps you, you have deeper knowledge, I'm hoping. Um, <clears throat> but we've always had this idea that um, at least with uh, people that are the general population and not immunosuppressed, that you're not getting cultural virus much past seven or eight days. Um, so what does this uh, prolonged antigen positive mean in your, in your viewpoint? Is this just a ton of virus that no longer is uh, replicative that are in our respiratory secretions. Why, why are we seeing this? Yeah, I think, uh, I think there's two things. I do not, uh, I, all of the data thus far shows that there's actually very high concordance between an antigen test positivity and culture positivity. Uh, and so this has really changed quite a bit. I think there's a few things that really changed uh, dramatically from the beginning of the pandemic, which was, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, and even really up until uh, breakthrough infections became the norm, 
uh, most people were not uh, developing symptoms until five, six, seven days after exposure. Uh, and then they were already, they were only starting to test themselves once their virus load was already at peak virus load. Uh, if, and, so, and oftentimes actually beyond peak virus load and the symptoms they were feeling were oftentimes uh, loss of smell, difficulty breathing. These were symptoms of uh, the virus actually uh, replicating to such high levels that it started to do damage to the body. And that, that, was, that was when people were first starting to feel the symptoms. And it was in many ways that due to a, a lack of pre-existing immunity to uh, raise the red flags that we're so used to seeing with infectious diseases and respiratory infections, where normally uh, with a common cold, the first symptoms that you get are actually immunologically mediated. And that's because you generally have pre-existing levels of immunity to kind of sense the viruses in you very quickly and start a fever response, uh, congestion, things like that. And so what has changed now that uh, we have viruses that are so able to cause breakthrough infections amongst people who have pre-existing immunity is now people are actually becoming symptomatic very early. Uh, within just a day or two of being exposed, people are starting to feel symptoms and are starting to test themselves. And if we go back in time, remember the CDC said uh, to, to Americans, uh, don't bother testing yourself. If you're gonna test yourself, wait five, six days before you actually use a test. Now people have ready access to these tests and they're actually testing themselves very early because their symptoms are telling them to, saying, hey, I think you might be infected body. Uh, why don't you use that rapid test that's in your home? And many people are finding that they're positive uh, sometimes days earlier than they otherwise would have been. So then just like your experience, uh, your experience where you actually got to witness the line getting darker over the two or three days of your infection would have almost never happened in the past. Almost always people were first identifying themselves as positive once the line was as dark as it was possibly gonna get and then they watched it come down. So that kind of adds an extra few days onto your perception of how long you've been positive relative to a, a, a previous version of you had you been infected a year and a half ago. So I think that's a big part of it is people are just the behavior of our immune system and behavior based on our access to tests has really allowed us to uh, identify ourselves as positive earlier, which makes it uh, makes us perceive that we're staying positive longer. But actually, most of the data does demonstrate that the kinetics seem to be pretty darn similar. Now that said, we also know that uh, some of the, that in particular, the new variants there do seem to be uh, not necessarily getting to higher viral titers, but they might actually be lasting and remaining positive and cultural, culturable even for uh, quite a bit longer. And when I say that, I mean on average a day or two, uh, but in any given individual, uh, some people are staying positive for 13, 14, 15 days. Now, one more thing on this note though, is that before when people didn't have access to frequently test themselves repeatedly, most people just stopped testing at day 10. Or they would, or really at day two, they would find out that they're positive, they'd isolate for 10 days and they'd go back. So only now that tests are available are people actually doing these sort of at home experiments and saying, oh, wow, I'm, I'm still infectious all the way out uh, to day 11 or 12. And, and maybe before that just wasn't being captured because most people weren't uh, studying it. But uh, so the, I think both of those are, are really at play here. Do, do we really know, though, at the moment, uh, whether people are infectious? Um, do we have any indirect data from public health and contact tracing or, or even um, uh, simultaneous culture, uh, longitudinal cultures, uh, if you believe culture is a surrogate for infectivity, um, in that 7 to 14 day plus time frame? Um, uh, do we know? I mean, uh, patients, you know, I've been telling them to be conservative, especially if there's at-risk people at home. Yeah, there is actually, so there's been a number of papers now uh, that have shown that people are staying culturable and positive for uh, beyond uh, five or seven days. Uh, for example, there's just a recent paper, I believe it was in NAJM uh, that uh, uh, I'd have to go back and find it, but uh, but it showed actually that the um, from the time of either symptom onset or test positivity, that the median duration of culturability was eight days from that period of time. That was the median uh, culturability. And it also showed very high concordance between 
uh, rapid antigen tests and culture positivity. So we do know, and I believe that actually 75, the, 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 the last quarter of individuals were actually remaining culture positive beyond day 10. Hmm. So, uh, which is actually quite different as, as you point out from earlier, when we look at the original papers from the Wuhan strain, it, they didn't go out that long, but again, we probably weren't identifying people and sort of starting that clock oftentimes because symptoms didn't start earlier and people were just weren't getting tested until you know, quite a ways into it. So that could be part of it, but also we know that the, the Omicron variants are massively transmissible and transmission isn't, you know, that while that is generally, you know, discussed in terms of transmitting to other people at a molecular level, we know that that is also the basis of that is the, the virus's ability to bind to a cell and infect that cell and replicate. And so even within the body, we should expect that if it's more transmissible across people, then smaller amounts are going to remain viable and continue transmitting within our own bodies. And so it's not that surprising if we do start to see the tail of the distribution uh, extending with these more infectious variants. Yeah, you, know, you wonder if it's back to the future with a 14 day isolation period, which was the original conservative choice, uh, if we remember, although so if you, I don't think anyone would pay attention to that now since we're at five days. Seems, uh, had always seemed a little aggressive um, to me, uh, but yeah. we're, you know, still there. Um, in the, the closing minutes, uh, just uh, another phenomenon, which again, I think is a consequence of home tests that you're not paying for, uh, is uh, Paxlovid rebound. Um, I've always had this sense that, as you said, with early testing, we're jumping on a, uh, a very effective drug that uh, suppresses viral infection quickly. And <clears throat> there really hasn't been uh, a, a adequate time for an immune response specifically against these new uh, variants and therefore you're seeing a, a rebound. Um, uh, in fact, the reason I didn't take it is I had to cancel a, a, a trip and I rescheduled it two weeks later. I did not want to deal with the uh, consequences of a Paxlovid rebound, whatever that frequency is, which I think is a little higher than currently understood. Uh, what's your sense of the Paxlovid rebound? Is it's, It seems like it fits into your um, uh, notion of people getting uh, uh, earlier uh, testing, the virus moving faster now in terms of producing symptoms in the background of uh, where we are? Yeah, I think uh, certainly I believe that, uh, and I think the data will, will bear this out, that Paxlovid rebound is probably quite a bit more frequent than the 1% trials have thus far shown. The way that there was a recent Mayo Clinic uh, review, or is really a chart review, came out and said that it was about 1%, but it was, it was not a study designed well to actually capture the true uh, rate of rebound. It was requiring people to first identify that they're having a rebound and then call up the telehealth physicians and a number of caveats there. Uh, so I think when we go, and we're actually starting a study to evaluate this right now, both between uh, where I am now, which is EMED and Scripps Research Institute, uh, we are uh, actually measuring the frequency of rebound after individuals get Paxlovid. Uh, and, you know, I honestly think it could be as high as 20%. Uh, it's hard to say, but there are, uh, there are a lot, uh, it's all anecdotal uh, information at the moment, uh, but uh, it seems to be very, very uh, frequent that we hear about it. The reason, I, I think it's a, it's, there might be a few different reasons. Um, one is exactly what, what you mentioned, which I think uh, is that people are starting to get on this treatment very quickly. Their immune system has, uh, is, is largely able to kind of take a back seat. So then when you release the pressure that's being applied on the virus from that Paxlovid and you kind of like release the virus, if you still have viable uh, virus left at day five, uh, then, and the immune system hasn't had to ramp up and you know, build up this strong immune response and actually be the responsible party for knocking down the virus, then the virus will obviously uh, you, pay, you take off the, the, the drug pressure and the virus will start replicating again if there's any viable virus left until it gets clobbered by the immune system. And at that point, the immune system maybe has to ramp up almost as though it's a new infection. 
And so this is uh, this really drives a question. You know, is there a different op uh, is there a different uh, type of dosing regimen? Should we be dosing Paxlovid for a few extra days, uh, or maybe in a very controversial approach would be uh, actually delay uh, starting Paxlovid for a few extra days. And actually, a thesis of my PhD that I, that I did was really based on almost this exact scenario, which was in the context of a brand new. Uh, epidemic or pandemic, if you have limited resources in terms of drugs, how to optimize those drugs so that you can keep somebody alive, but also give them some immunological protection from the exposure. And, uh, and we might be seeing that. There's a, a different line of thinking that I've been going down lately that I would say is, in, for people listening, is entirely unfounded. Uh, but it, it does, this is a very potent drug, Paxlovid, in terms of its ability to inhibit a very important uh, protein in our body called CYP3A4. And, and this, uh, we know that this protein does uh, get activated during other infections. And I would say that we haven't adequately studied what does it mean to uh, use this to sort of, what does it mean to block this, this enzyme, you know, for an acute respiratory virus like this? Is it, is it somehow limiting some other cascade that we would have otherwise expected? So that's an area that I'm hoping uh, some folks will kind of undertake and try to understand uh, a little bit better. Uh, it's a little bit further afield, um, but you know, when, when we start knocking down pretty important uh, enzymes, I think we have to wonder what, what are some of the consequences when it's part of this uh, pretty significant of 450 uh, you know, ecosystem that, that exists in our metabolic processes. Yeah, I think it's always important to consider alternative hypotheses. As so many times, it's you know you're looking at what you think is the obvious, and it's not. So, well, I, I really want to thank you for um, uh, discussing the testing issues um, and also how um, with some of our treatments and the current uh, Omicron uh, sublineage waves that we're currently experiencing may um, be. Uh, uh, something that uh, patients and will be bringing up and uh, some of your insights, I think, have been uh, fantastic to try to help understand this process and perhaps by the seat of our pants, make, help make decisions with our patients. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, don't, Go ahead. I don't know if I can add one other thing that I didn't say a moment ago, but I do think for listeners, uh, you know, one of the most important things still though to keep in mind, especially for vulnerable populations is despite rebound, uh, Paxlovid is still massively, massively beneficial. It is still really cutting down hospitalizations. All the data shows that it's still working very well. Um, and so I, I wouldn't want the notion of rebound for somebody who is at risk uh, of hospitalization. I would say the, the risk associated with rebound uh, is much less than the risk of not getting the treatment. Uh, and so I would, I would probably, I would encourage people who uh, to not, uh, to not seek uh, medical uh, care because they don't think that there's treatment. There's also monoclonal antibodies that are very, very effective as well. And so I, I, I don't want listeners to get the wrong impression that uh, Paxlovid is not useful just because we were talking about something that happens in a fraction of, of individuals. I mean, th those are such important points. Thank you for bringing them up. So I want to thank you for listening to this program. And if you didn't listen to the other program where we tackle immunization, immunity, and the uh, current Omicron uh, variants uh, that are circulating, uh, please tune in. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Thank you for that information. If you're tuning into our webcast, please click the claim credit button in the webinar console to attest for credit. Otherwise, please visit us at covid19.dkbmed.com. Again, thank you for joining us and thank you for your dedication to your patients with COVID-19.